With the South Carolina Gamecocks facing an easier opponent in the Charlotte 49ers this upcoming Saturday, what is it that they need to accomplish overall? Plus, what needs to change with this offense? I'll discuss that more today on the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. You are Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, your show for daily headlines and potential storylines on your favorite South Carolina Gamecock sports teams. I'm your host, Andrew Lyon, and as always, thank you once again for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your first listen every day. We are free and available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts daily. And as I mentioned in the cold open For today's show, we are going to talk about what the South Carolina Gamecocks need to accomplish against the Charlotte 49ers and what is essentially going to serve as a bit of a reset for South Carolina in this matchup. The Gamecocks, of course, have played a few really tough opponents to start off this season. And uh, yeah, it is very apparent right now what the issues are with this team on both sides of the ball. So I'm going to discuss that in segment one of today's show. In segment two, I'm going to sort of continue the conversation that I had on Monday regarding the issues with the offense. But this time, I'm going to try to actually provide some solutions that I think would help this South Carolina team a little bit more on that side of the ball. And then in the final segment of today's show, I'll discuss what Shane Beamer said on his Sunday teleconference call regarding the latest updates on some key injuries for South Carolina's football team. That is going to be the roadmap for today's show, so let's go ahead and get on right into it. Also, we're not going to do a Q&A today because uh, there just wasn't a whole lot of responses, honestly, to that. And with what happened last weekend, I will just go ahead and say I can understand why some of y'all maybe wouldn't have the uh, the optimism or motivation to want to really throw any questions out there right now. Because, of course, there's plenty of questions already that are pretty much set in stone. So let's talk about some of the questions pertaining to the Charlotte 49ers. What needs to happen against a team like the Charlotte 49ers? Well, I'm going to go ahead and say this. On the offensive side of the ball, the South Carolina Gamecocks should absolutely dominate the Charlotte 49ers on Saturday. And as a whole, this game ought to be a blowout. The spread, depending on where you look, is somewhere between 23 to 25 and a half points. I believe that Online had the initial spread for this game in favor of the Gamecocks, minus 24 and a half, I want to say. So, yeah, a lot of odds makers think that South Carolina should win comfortably in this game. Of course, again, after what we've seen the last few weeks, obviously, there might be a bit of hesitation for some Gamecock fans on putting some money down on this spread in favor of South Carolina. So, Let's talk about why I say the offense should dominate the Charlotte 49ers defense. Here are some interesting numbers for y'all to keep in mind. Charlotte's defense, up to this point in the season, four games in, has given up 182 total points. That works out to be about 45.5 points per game being allowed. This includes giving up 41 points to William and Mary, which... Just to keep things simple, they're an FCS school. That's a whole level below even the Charlotte 49ers who are in the FBS. In terms of yards given up per game, the Charlotte 49ers have given up an average of 563 or 64 yards per game. First downs allowed, 111 total through four games. That works out to be a little over 25 and a little less than 30 first downs. That is not a range that your defense should ever want to see over that many ball games. And then on third down defense, the 49ers still have not been able to get things done. They've allowed their opponents to convert 28 of their 51 third down attempts. That is a 54.9% third down conversion rate for Charlotte's opponents. Again, that is not a number that as a defensive coordinator you ever want to see. It is definitely something that would keep you up at night if you were in that kind of spot. And then the last thing to note real quick, Charlotte's defense, at least up to this point in the season, they have not been good at forcing turnovers. They've only forced two turnovers collectively in their first four games. So, An overall synopsis of this defense, this 49ers defense allows offenses to extend drives for long periods of time, 
They cannot get off the field when they have the opportunities to do so, and they can't keep teams out of the red zone, and subsequently, they can't keep teams out of the end zone. Essentially, there is not a whole lot that this Charlotte 49ers defense has done right up to this point in the season. So, what do the Gamecocks need to do on offense because of all this? Well, Firstly, the Gamecocks need to establish the run game. I talked about this on yesterday's show. We've got to start prioritizing the running game early on in these matchups. We are getting behind by a couple of scores against better teams like Arkansas and Georgia. And then all of a sudden, that's when we decide we want to start to get the ground game going. That is not the time to do that. And quite frankly, it's a slap in the face to Marshawn Lloyd and Juju McDowell for how talented they are to not get more attention in this offense. So establish the run game. And subsequently, work on avoiding third and long situations. South Carolina, too often this season at this point, have found themselves in situations where they're seeing a third and eight or a third and 10, or they're staring at a third and 12, a third and 15. And the offense is having to make a lot of happen in a short amount of time on that third down play in order to be able to convert. This is why the Gamecocks have struggled mightily in this specific facet. Another thing the Gamecocks offense needs to do, they need to work the passing game from short yardage to deep shots. In my opinion, South Carolina has tried to do sort of the exact opposite. They've tried to use deep shots more so at the beginning and then have utilized the shorter passing game if either those deep shots have not been working or, of course, just to keep defenses honest. That is not the way South Carolina needs to be operating. Spencer Rattler has been pressing a lot in these first few games this season. Again, he is clearly still trying to get adjusted to this pro-style offense, a system that he has only operated in three games. So South Carolina has got to utilize the shorter passing game early on. They need to build up the confidence of Spencer Rattler. Get some shorter completions going. Get his confidence up. Get his morale up. Again, utilize your playmakers on the edges. That's where you should really try to utilize each and every guy you have on this roster. Make Charlotte have to tackle in space. Again, based on all the numbers I just listed earlier, they are not a good defense. You ought to really stress them horizontally and vertically. And again, if the short passing game is working, then that will help you not only in terms of your vertical passing game, it will also help you in terms of your inside run game. So, you need to work the short passing game on the edges especially a lot more at the start, just like the run game. And then lastly, you need to use this game as a chance to run some different concepts and see what works smoothly and what doesn't. Because I'll just go ahead and say this. If South Carolina's offense cannot make certain concepts work against this defense in Charlotte and against South Carolina State the following week, who is an FCS program at the end of the day, then, yeah, at that point, Satterfield, you need to see that those are concepts that you probably should not be running. You need to go ahead and crumble them up, find the nearest trash bin, toss them in there, light it on fire. Maybe don't do that part, but just bottom line, wipe it clean from your memory. Don't keep trying to make the players implement this in the scheme. Forget it and move on and try to come up with something different. So that is what South Carolina's offense needs to do against Charlotte's defense. Now, just a couple moments, I'll talk about what South Carolina's defense needs to try to accomplish against Charlotte's offense, which is not really that much better than Charlotte's defense overall. But before I do that, I need to pass along a message from our sponsors for today's show in Upside. And... Upside is a really big help to a lot of people because they know that people cringe when they go to the gas pump. They know that they don't like to see those big checks at their favorite dine-in restaurants because they know that inflation has been hitting all of us. I started using Upside because of how much my wallet has taken a hit in recent months. Upside's an incredible app for anyone who is constantly out on the go, buying gas, getting groceries, or dining out, or traveling for work. With every purchase, I'm earning cash back thanks to Upside. And I use this app to help alleviate my wallet whenever I'm going to make my weekly run to get groceries. Or again, if I need to go get gas after I just went to the gym. Or if I went to just go buy some things online in order to make this setup potentially look a little bit better for all of you who watch this show on YouTube. Or for those of you who are listening on audio podcast. This isn't too good to be true. It is free and easy to use. And take it from me, I have used it and it works great. To get started, download the free Upside app. Then use our promo code LOCKED and get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. 
Next, claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside. Then check in at the business, pay as usual with a credit or debit card, and get paid instantly. Upside users are earning more than a million dollars in cash back every single week. And if you still question how good this app is, I'll let the 4.8 star rating on the App Store speak for itself. So download the free Upside app today, and one more time, use the promo code LOCKED to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Welcome back to segment two of this Tuesday edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day. All right, so I talked about what South Carolina's offense needs to do against Charlotte's defense this upcoming Saturday. Now let's talk about what South Carolina's defense needs to do against Charlotte's offense. Now, Charlotte's offense, again, is a little bit better than their defense, and From what I could tell based on what I was looking at with Charlotte's schedule, it does seem like that they have had some sort of issue at quarterback. I'm not sure if one guy hasn't maybe played super well and they've been swapping guys out or if a guy got injured and came back last week. I will look into that further for the Wednesday show. But for today, let's simply focus on these two numbers. Rushing yards per game. 97.25. This is not a very good rushing offense, again, just based off the box score numbers. This does not seem like a team in which South Carolina is going to have to worry about a heavy rushing attack, which, again, will be a stark contrast to what they've had to go up against the last three weeks with the teams they've played in Georgia State, Arkansas, and Georgia, who can all prioritize their running game in a very big way. That will not be an issue, it seems like, in this case against Charlotte. Third down offense, the 49ers are not a very good team in terms of third down conversion rate as they've only converted a third of their third downs up to this point this season. To be more technical, they've converted 18 of their 54 third down attempts. So again, does not seem like an offense who can run the ball very well or maybe doesn't prioritize it very much. And if you can get them to third down more often than not, your defense is probably going to be able to find a way to get off the field, which is something that the Gamecock defense is going to need to try to change starting this week. So with that being said, what do they need to do this coming Saturday? Well, Overall, South Carolina's defense has got to get back to basic fundamentals, and they got to do the little things right over the course of a 60-minute football game. This defense has got to do better about rallying to the football and gang tackling. The last two weeks between the Arkansas and the Georgia games, South Carolina's defense missed 65 different tackles which is unacceptable, quite frankly, regardless of the opponent. And again, that's not to say that South Carolina's defense is not trying, of course. They're giving a ton of effort whenever they go out there. But it really does not matter what opponent you are facing. You cannot be giving up 65 or you cannot be missing 65 tackles over two straight football games. That just cannot happen. And then like I mentioned or alluded to earlier, they've got to do better at getting off the field on third down. Arkansas and Georgia dominated South Carolina for the most part in terms of third down conversions as they converted 14 of the combined 25 attempts that both teams had. While against Georgia State, South Carolina only let the Panthers convert five of their 17 third down attempts, which was obviously a way better percentage. South Carolina has got to get back to numbers like that, especially against a team like Charlotte. This is a good week for them to do just that. So that's what I think the defense needs to do overall against this Charlotte 49ers offense. They need to start doing the little things correctly once again. So let's go back to South Carolina's offense real quick. If you watched or listened to my Monday show, then you would know that I talked at length about South Carolina's offense and the issues that they've had so far this season. And of course, there were certain moments where, quite frankly, um, I was just letting y'all know what I thought was wrong with this offense. And I list and I listed off a ton of different components that I felt like could be improved. But I will admit, I did not offer a whole lot of solutions. And if I'm going to be someone that is going to have some constructive criticism for this football team, or really and truthfully more so for the coaching side of things, then I need to probably at least offer some insight on what I think they need to do better. So 
for today's show, I came up with just a couple of different items for both formations and play calling that I think that the Gamecocks need to do better or maybe should try to think about implementing on the offensive side of the ball. For formations, we need to do some more two tight end sets. It is my opinion, and again, just my opinion probably alone out of a lot of the hosts for the Locked On Podcast Network, I think that South Carolina's got probably one of the three deepest tight end rooms in the SEC conference as a whole. I'm not even going to try to argue putting up South Carolina's tight end room against Georgia's. Uh, Yeah, nobody is going to be convinced of that. And quite frankly, I probably couldn't convince myself of that no matter how hard I could try. So not going to talk about that. But really and truthfully, can you name another tight end room in the SEC that has the depth that South Carolina does? Because you think about it. We got guys like Jaheim Bell. Austin Stockner, Travion Keenan, and Nate Atkins. All four of these guys have different skill sets, have different ways in which they can help this football team, but they all have a ton of experience and they've all shown that they can be very, very productive when they are given their opportunities. We have not seen very much of Nate Atkins and Travion Keenan at all up to this point in this season, which I can understand to a certain extent because they're both basically the two backup tight ends behind Jaheim Bell and Austin Stockner. So obviously, Those guys are not going to see as much playing time in terms of offense. But there was one thing that I thought that we would see a lot more of with this offensive play calling, and that was more two tight end sets. Look, Nate Atkins and Travion Keener are both really, really solid blockers in the running game. These guys have got to be utilized in this aspect more. And I think that one way to do this is to have them both line up on opposite sides of the offensive line and then have a few plays where, look, before the ball is snapped and the handoff is given to whatever running backs in the backfield, have one of those two guys motion to the other side. That way, it goes from a split tight end set, you know, again, with both guys on opposite sides, to now you have a twin tight end set, clearly strong side to one side of the field. You have got to do that a little bit more. You want to get some of these edge runs to work a little bit better. I think that that would be a pretty good start is to have guys that, again, specialize in blocking out there a little bit more in those kind of tight end sets. Same deal with Austin Stogner and Jaheim Bell. Both of these guys have different ways they can beat a defense. Jaheim Bell, obviously, is a fantastic athlete. Probably runs like a 4-5, 40-yard dash. Can play anywhere on the field. Has really good hands. Just about anything that you can list, Jaheim Bell can probably accomplish. Austin Stogner, again, he's not going to be a burner like Jaheim Bell. He's not a guy that you can send at the running back spot and have him take a handoff on like a halfback stretch or a halfback zone play. But Austin Stogner is like 6 foot 7, 250 semi pounds. You should be using that more. You need to be making defensive coordinators have to stay awake at night by having more formations where you have both these guys out there. Have them lined up next to each other. Have them both lined up in line with the offensive line, especially if you manage to get to the red zone. That way, it's pretty much, hey, defense, we don't care who you want to cover. Pick your poison. You want to cover the guy who can probably catch about any ball that gets thrown his way and is too big for literally any of you to cover and too fast and too good with his route running for a linebacker to go one-on-one against? Or you could try to cover Jaheim Bell if you want to. Just know he might cheek you out of your cleats. And uh, yeah, he has speed to match up against probably almost any defensive back that you got out on the field right now. You need to do stuff like that. That is a way in which you utilize your personnel, you can use certain guys as decoys, and you can create multiple plays out of that. You also need to line up in more bunch and stack formations and sets and have them sometimes lined up close to the line of scrimmage. With bunch and stack formations, the idea is you got multiple guys in such a small space. With a bunch formation, it's a group of three players, and I've talked about this before. It could be like an upside-down triangle shape between the three or an upright triangle shape. But either way, you got three guys that are lined up right next to each other. In a stacked formation, you can have guys who are literally lined up behind one another on different areas of the field. What makes that nightmarish for defensive coordinators is there's no way to guess what kind of play is coming. You don't know which guy's going to go where. You don't know what kind of route it's going to be. You don't know if it's going to be some sort of like quick screen. It could be maybe a halfback pitch or toss to the strong side of a bunch formation. There's so many things that you could do with those kind of things. I have seen us run the bunch formation admittedly a little bit, so I do need to give Satterfield some credit for that. But I don't feel like that we're running that kind of formation enough. That's a formation where, look, you don't have to create specific personnel groupings. You could just send guys out there and force the defense to have to figure out, hey, who's going to get the ball? 
That would be something that would help out this offense a good deal, in my opinion. From a play-calling perspective, I mentioned earlier, so I won't talk about it too much, you need to prioritize the running game more early on in ball games. Make defenses have to respect the running game, and therefore, you can really start to increase the efficiency of this passing game. Call some more high, mid, low route concepts. Literally, if you want to make this easier for Spencer Rattler to get completions down the field, to be able to move the football, make it simple. Make it to where there's a guy at every single level on the strong side of the field. Have one guy running like a spacing route underneath. Have another guy running sort of a deep dig route. And then the outside receiver could run like a post route or a go route. Do something like that. So again, he can just simply go, okay, that guy's not open. That guy's not, but this guy's open and he can get the ball out faster. I think that that would help Spencer Rattler out a great deal. And then another thing that would help him out, call some more plays that will get him to go on the move. I'm not saying he's got to do some read option, some zone read or anything like that. I'm definitely not saying that. But call some rollout plays. Call some bootleg type plays. Call some plays that will get the pocket moved from one area on the field to a different one horizontally. That way, you're going to make the defense have to account for that. Rattler will get a little bit more time. He'll probably feel a little bit more comfortable being able to go out there and just to be instinctual for once. Not have to sit there and have a million things running through his mind, again, with a pro-style offense that he's now running, and also, you know, wondering if there's going to be a guy that's going to literally pop him right upside the mouth in a second, or if he's actually got time. Because it's clear he's had issues with that part. So, have him roll out of the pocket, and if you do that sort of thing, then I think that that would actually work to calm him down a little bit because that is where Spencer Rattler is in his element the most. These are the things that I think this offense needs to do more from a formation and play calling standpoint in order to try to address some of the issues and problems that they have had so far this season. Now, in just a few moments, I will talk about the injury update that Shane Beamer gave at his Sunday teleconference call with the local media on multiple defensive starters heading into this coming weekend. But first, a quick word from a few sponsors. Welcome back to the final segment of today's edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your team every single day in just 30 minutes. All right, let's talk about injuries real quick. Obviously, this is something that has really plagued the Gamecocks for a couple of weeks now. South Carolina Lost, of course, Muhammad Kappa and Jordan Stride in the middle of the Arkansas game, which really sort of threw a wrench into their plans, I'm sure, in that football game. And then this past week against Georgia, they didn't have guys like Alex Boogie Huntley, Cam Smith, David Spaulding, who was a key rotational defensive back. They also had Darius Rush once again have to leave the game at one point due to injury. I think that's happened in every single game for him up to this point, which is not a good sign. And even Devonnie Reed got hurt in this past weekend's contest against Georgia. So what is the latest on all these guys? Well, Shane Beamer talked to the media on his Sunday teleconference call just a couple days ago. And the update that he gave was overall pretty optimistic, specifically regarding Darius Rush and Devontae Reed, who both got hurt in the middle of the Georgia game. He said that they both passed whatever tests they had to go through on Sunday, and those tests came back negative. So, in other words, basically, they both seem to be okay. Of course, he did kind of hint at the fact that they'll try to see, you know, how they're doing in practice all the way through this week. But he said that he was optimistic that both of these guys would be good to go against the Charlotte 49ers, which, again, with how decimated that this secondary has been with injuries for the last couple of weeks, they could desperately use some good news in terms of the injury front. With the other guys, Alex Bookie Huntley, Cam Smith, and David Spaulding, he pretty much said that uh, they're kind of in a wait-and-see game with those three right now. Basically, sort of the same deal as Darius Rush and Devontae Reed. They'll see how things go throughout the week. Of course, again, with the fact that the Gamecocks are playing an opponent like Charlotte, I'm not trying to say we need to overlook them because they did just happen to defeat Georgia State this past weekend, which tells me that, um, yeah, they're not completely terrible. They do have some potential here. But if you need to sit any of these guys, honestly, let them take a little bit more time to rest up and heal up, then we should do that. But he did make it sound like that there would be a chance that all three of these guys could play. But again, more so in wait-and-see mode with Boogie Huntley, Cam Smith, and David Spaulding compared to Darius Rush and Devonnie Reed. So that pretty much does it for today's show, the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast. I hope that y'all thoroughly enjoyed today's show. As always, 
What are sort of your initial thoughts on Charlotte based on the statistics that I listed on today's show? What do you think the goal should be for South Carolina on offense and defense heading into this matchup? And also, who do you hope sees the field this coming Saturday for South Carolina? Obviously, we hope that all these guys are going to be back there on the field. But again, with the amount of injuries that we have right now, we probably aren't going to see every single guy out there. By the way, Corey Rucker could also potentially play for the first time all season. Shane Beamer did also hint at that. So, out of all these guys, who would you really like to see be able to play? Or maybe which position do you think really needs the reinforcements the most? I want to hear all of y'all's thoughts, as always, down below in the comments section if you're watching today's show on YouTube. But, of course, if you're listening to today's show on an audio podcast app, wherever you get your podcast daily, you can also feel free to shoot me a message at a lion underscore sc on twitter and i'll be sure to respond to any replies or comments that you have for me as quickly as i see him and of course if you've enjoyed the locked on game cox podcast but you want to get some more news on the entire sec conference maybe you want to hear why alabama is struggling so much against teams like the texas longhorns what's going on down in gainesville they almost lost to south florida this past weekend for gosh sakes you want to know what's going on with all those teams check out chris gordy over on the locked on sec podcast he takes you across the entire conference in just 30 minutes a pretty difficult task to do for 14 teams so he does a great job over there be sure to give him a listen after of course you have listened to the locked on gamecocks podcast but once again y'all that does it for me on today's show i hope that y'all have a great rest of your tuesday and i will catch y'all on the next show of the locked on gamecocks podcast